Thank you, everyone. I'll just adjust. Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose lands we gather tonight and to pay my respects to Elders past and present. I have the total honour tonight of speaking before a performance by Australian artist Christian Thompson, a man I have a lot of admiration for who works across photo media, video and performance and is re represented in this year's Anland Award exhibition, The Space Between Us. Thompson is one of the inaugural Charlie Perkins Scholars at Oxford University, where he and fellow student Paul Gray began their postgraduate studies in 2010 as Oxford's first Indigenous scholars. And Thompson has been shaking up the normal there at Oxford and at the associated Pitt Rivers Museum with his work, We Bury Our Own, where he reconsiders and urges viewers to reconsider the museum's early photographic collections of Australian Aboriginal people. So I'd like especially to acknowledge Christian Thompson, who is a Bijara man of the Kunja Nation of Southwest Queensland and any of his family and friends in the audience today. And before the performance, I've been asked to speak about performance and performance art in general. I love performance, which is handy as the co-director of Performance Space. We're a Sydney-based arts organisation that presents performance as it relates to the visual arts, to theatre, contemporary dance, contemporary music, sound, film, site responsive practice, participatory art, live art, pervasive gaming, new media, and it goes on. We turn 30 this year as an organisation. And it's interesting to note that the Art Gallery of New South Wales has been presenting performance as part of its programming since 1973, 40 years. And Performance Space has actually collaborated with the gallery on, on the project America by Mike Parr, which was, was presented outside the gallery in 2006. Personally, um, I prefer public singing over public speaking, um, rather like an untalented version of Robin Archer. But let me spare you all that and start with something spoken, with poetry. I sing the body electric, the armies of those I love engirth me and I engirth them. They will not let me off until I go with them, respond to them and discorrupt them and charge them with the full charge of the soul. The love of the body of man or woman bulks account, the body itself bulks account, that of the male is perfect, and that of the female is perfect. The expression of the face bulks account, but the expression of a well-made man appears not only in his face, it is in his limbs and joints also. It is curiously in the joints of his hips and wrists. It is in his walk, the carriage of his neck, the flex of his waist and knees. Dress does not hide him. The strong, sweet, supple quality he has strikes through the cotton and flannel. To see him pass conveys as much as the best poem, perhaps more. You linger to see his back and the back of his neck and shoulder side. The sprawl and fullness of babes, the bosoms and heads of women, the folds of their dress, their style as we pass in the street, the contour of their shape downwards, the swimmer naked in the swimming bath, seen as he swims through the transparent green shine, or lies with his face up and rolls silently to and fro in the heave of the water. The bending forward and backward of rowers in rowboats, the horseman in his saddle. Girls, mothers, housekeepers, all in their performances. The group of labourers seated at noontime with their open dinner kettles and their wives waiting the female soothing a child, the farmer's daughter in the garden or cow yard, the young fellow hoeing corn, the sleigh driver guiding his six horses through the crowd, the wrestle of wrestlers, two apprentice boys, quite grown, lusty, good-natured, native-born, out on the vacant lot at sundown after work, the coats and caps thrown down, the embrace of love and resistance, the upper hold and the underhold, the hair rumpled over and blinding the eyes, the march of firemen in their own costumes, the play of masculine muscle through clean setting trousers and waist straps, 
the slow return from the fire, the pause when the bell strikes suddenly again and the listening on the alert, the natural, perfect, varied attitudes, the bent head, the curved neck and the counting. Such like I love, I loosen myself, I pass freely, I am at the mother's breast with the little child, swim with the swimmers, wrestle with the wrestlers, march in line with the firemen and pause, listen and count. They were several stanzas from I Sing the Body Electric by American poet Walt Whitman from his collection Leaves of Grass. Like the photographs that Christian Thompson may have researched in the Pitt Rivers Museum, these words were first printed in the middle of the 19th century. What endures for me about this poem is its celebration of the everyday performance of humanity as we socialise with one another and the potential for beauty to be found in human exchange for those with eyes to see it. For the opening of the Anne Lander Award on the 15th of May this year, artist Alicia Frankovich choreographed a work called Free Time, which began in this vast space with many people engaged in quite ordinary physical and mental activity, though somewhat displaced. They were performing yoga exercises, reading books, surfing the internet. Among them, there were more theatrically staged characters also walking around, hikers and bird watchers, amateur actors. Just before seven o'clock, they were joined by two dozen runners coursing through the main entrance, panting out of breath. Then teams of young football players sweating after practice and followed by an almost peloton of cyclists carrying their bikes and setting them down in the space. The result was a crowd of differently attired and energetically orientated people being watched by quite another crowd who kept a strange and respectful distance, differently coded humans in the presence of other humans in space. There are many artists through history that, that work and have worked with performance as a way to bring everyday perspectives and personal politics into the rarefied space of the, of the gallery, and for many different reasons, not always institutionally sanctioned or desired. <clears throat> American artist Yvonne Rayner is a seminal performance figure in this regard. She wrote a manifesto for performance making in 1964, specifically about dance, which at the time was dominated by ballet and the exuberant moder modernism of Martha Graham. Rayner wanted something real, something of ordinary contemporary substance to ring true in contemporary dance and its choreography. This is her No Manifesto of 1964. No to spectacle, no to virtuosity, no to transformations and magic and make-believe, no to the glamour and transcendency of the star image, no to the heroic, no to the anti-heroic, no to trash imagery, no to the involvement of performer or spectator, no to style, no to camp, no to seduction of spectator by the wiles of the performer, no to eccentricity, no to moving or being moved. Earlier this year, Performance Space presented a lecture and workshop by Sarah Wookie through the New York-based organization Performer. Wookie is one of the few performers authorized to present Rayner's seminal and complicated choreographic work, Trio A. In her lecture about the work, Wookie spoke of the liberating experience of economy in re-performing, demonstrating, and teaching Rayner's work to other people. In fact, the luxury of economy. No set, no makeup, no lighting array, no razzle dazzle whatsoever. Just the body of the performer in motion and those watching her. In 1969, American artist Merle Laderman Ukeles wrote a manifesto for maintenance art, finding herself cut off from the avant-garde after having a baby surprise, surprise. Projects around the manifesto included the involvement of service-based art gallery personnel, attendants, security staff, and cleaners in its manifestation. And after repeated knockbacks of her proposals from major galleries, the curator and critic Lucy Lippard included Eukalis in a traveling exhibition of conceptual art by female artists. 
As part of this project, she, she contributed a selection of performances as personal maintenance, as art. She washed the steps of a Connecticut museum with water and diapers and organised a ritual cleaning of glass display cases. Reflections of this work can be seen in the contemporary practice of artists such as Tino Segal, who I believe um, will be showing here at, at some point this year, and whose work has been universally embraced by powerful curators and institutions around the world, and he's just won the Golden Lion for the Best Artist at the Venice Biennale this year. But Ukele, since 1977, has been the resident artist at the New York Department for Sanitation, and she strives to make transformative art in her region and her locality. Working outside of the gallery, and also in the late 60s, Taiwanese-American artist Taishing Hsei took notions of daily life to extremes with a number of one-year performances. From 1980 to 1981, he devised a year-long project whereby he had to clock into a time punch card system like those used by shift workers every hour on the hour for an entire year, totally limiting his behaviour and sleep patterns. From 1981 to 1982, he lived entirely outside under the Brooklyn Bridge, never allowed to take shelter in buildings. From the 4th of July 1983 to the 4th of July 1984, he lived tied to fellow artist Linda Montano by an eight-foot piece of rope, during which time they were never allowed to touch. Like many conceptual artists of the time, Say was interested in the limits of freedom within contrived structures and social systems, the working day, rest, the nature and limitation of friendship, marriage, the social status of a country's citizens. These endurance works made their way into galleries through photographic documentation and the artist's systematised reporting processes often conveyed through lawyers as notaries. Hesse made extraordinary the ordinary in paying acute attention to the passing of time, which he anchored his practice to, forcing a consideration of modern human existence. To Australia. Mike Parr is an artist who's worked as deftly across video and drawing as he has durational performance and has been presented by institutions all over Australia and internationally, and particularly here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales with his relationship with recently retired curator Tony Bond. Last week I visited an exhibition in Melbourne at the Monash University Museum of Art called Direct Democracy in which was screened a documentation of Mike Parr's performance, Un-Australian, which was presented at Artspace 10 years ago. Mike's performance followed the invasion of Iraq by Allied forces, including the Australian Defence Force. Here is his artist statement. At 6 p.m. on Friday, May the 2nd, in the presence of the public, an assistant will begin sewing up my face. My face is sewn into a bind. Goddard has left for Iraq and the bewildered Australian amputee has followed him. I sit still facing the audience through Friday night, all day Saturday. A small Australian flag hangs limply from the stump of my left arm. On the wall behind me is lettered a vast field of lyrical aggression interdispersed with newspaper headlines. Bloodbath, hunting pack, filling holes in a bullet-riddled nation, killing room, hundreds of victims in coffins, children were burned alive, critics branded with hot irons, end game, we are closer to the centre of the Iraqi capital than many American commuters are to their downtown offices. Please don't hate our dads, etc., etc. At 6pm on Saturday night until midnight, Democratic torture begins. By touching a, hop, a hot spot on their screens, the global audience can shock my exhausted face. In the video documentation of this work, pa, which is also held here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Pa is shown seated stoically while a nurse pushes needle and thread through his mouth, his eyelids, his ears, sealing up his face, save his nasal passages. It goes without saying that this is a difficult video to watch. 
and it reduced me to tears last week as it did when I saw the documentation 10 years ago. And part of this strong emotion is about the political context in which this work is made. Pa made this work in relation to the duality of our nation's involvement in waging war against a nation while simultaneously holding asylum seekers, men, women and children from that same country in lengthy detention, sometimes years behind razor wire. In 2002, Australian media reported that 58 refugees had sewn their lips together as a final desperate act protesting their detention at the Woomera facility in South Australia. Pa's practice continues to remind us that everyday life, for some people, is the endurance of incarceration and the denial of freedom. Two weeks ago, as a participant in the Australian Theatre Forum in Canberra, I was reminded by the Western Sydney director, Claudia Chidiak, of the sol solidarity felt among artists, performers, theatre makers, activists and arts workers at the same time as Mike was making this work about speaking out for these rights of asylum seekers and protesting Australia's lack of compassionate, humane policy for vulnerable, vulnerable humans seeking shelter, uprooted by war, famine, poverty. She reminded us of the great sense of empowerment felt by the community at the time, that we could change the situation and even policy through personal and public action. The art gang based in Sydney, Boat People, who among its numbers include the visual artists Deborah Kelly, Samu Sivanesan and Zara Ahmed, have been making work in relation to the Australian government's stance on asylum seekers since the Tampa incident in 2001 over change in government and several changes in leadership. Their participatory performative actions include the muffled protest, which responded to young white rioters in Cronulla in 2007, sporting the Australian flag as a superhero cape and as a symbol of white Australian supremacy. Boat people organised quiet protests on the steps of the Opera House and in Federation Square in Melbourne, where members of the public joined and wore the flags over their heads, covering their faces entirely. On the 4th of June 2009, the 20th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, artist Deborah Kelly organised a mass and global performance of a choreography to memorialise the heroism of a lone Chinese man facing off a row of tanks heading into Tiananmen Square. This action, which was captured on camera, remains an enduring image not only of the events at Tiananmen Square, but of the bravery, defiance and resistance of individuals against immense, immense militarised regimes. I performed this work in front of the Opera House with dozens of other people over the course of two hours in total silence. Through an instructional video, the, chore the choreography was conveyed to hundreds of people across the globe who organised their own memorials on the same day. And the point I'm trying to make, and coming a long time to getting to, is about the inherent immediacy and urgency of some performance art, its context and its temporality. It is made in front of our eyes. There is no mediating object or image between you as watchers and listeners and the artist as subject and conveyor of action. And for me, the politics and the context of that moment of exchange is just as important as the act itself. So when re-performances of artists' works are stage, such as those undertaken with massive institutional support by high-profile artists like Marina Abramovich and for large-scale projects like 13 Rooms, what is presented is necessarily a distillation of the performance that was. And not all performances can be re-performed, either by the artist or a stand-in. And this isn't a criticism, but just a reminder that performance art doesn't always arrive in tidy packages for presentation. To quote Guillermo Gomez Peña of transdisciplinary arts organisation La Poche Nostra, as he writes in his essay in defence of performance art, <clears throat> Our relationship with the art world, in capitals, is bittersweet, to say the least. We have traditionally operated in the cultural borders and social margins where we feel the most comfortable. 
Whenever we venture into the stark postmodern luxury of the mainstream chic, say, to present our work in a major museum, we tend to feel a bit out of place. During our stay, we befriend the security guards, the cleaning personnel, and the staff in the education department. The chief curators watch us attentively from a distance. Only the night before our departure will we be invited for drinks. Mainstream art institutions have a love-hate relationship with us, or rather, with what they perceive we represent. Whenever they invite us in, they're always trembling nervously, as if secretly expecting us to destroy the walls of the gallery, scratch a painting with a prop or pee in the lobby. The self-proclaimed international art world is constantly shifting its attitude towards us. One year we are in, the next one we are out. The fact that performance artists don't produce sleek objects for display makes it hard for the commercial art, art apparatuses and the critics who sanction it to justify our presence in mainstream shows and biennales. And it's only when the art world is having a crisis of ideas that we get asked to participate and only for a short period of time." End quote. At the moment, Performance Space is presenting a durational performance work by Sydney artist John A. Douglas, which I've been working on with the artist for a couple of years. Douglas is an artist living with kidney disease who undergoes daily 10-hour peritoneal dialysis treatments to stay alive. Lately, he's been making work that directly addresses his reliance on life support to exist on planet Earth, and he's recast himself as a humanoid life form, rather like David Bowie in The Man Who Fell to Earth, only on dialysis. He's performing a devised choreography for the 10-hour duration of his treatment, as part of his exhibition, Body Fluid 2, which is running all this week for the International Symposium of Electronic Art. Douglas is interested in making public the kinds of experiences that are kept hidden, and he's been working with the Museum of Human Disease at the University of New South Wales, one of the only museums of pathology in the Southern Hemisphere that's open to the public, to create images and animations to situate his performance within. Earlier this year, my colleague Jeff Kahn, who's the co-director of Performance Space, curated a vast exhibition of work by Sarah J. Norman, an artist who works across sculpture, installation and performance to address Australia's intertwined indigenous and colonial histories, often featuring traces of her body and other animal bodies, blood, bone, fur, hair and skin. The works of the unsettling suite connect Norman's own personal history and family narratives and in particular, her Aboriginal and British heritage with the larger histories of post-colonial Australia, exploring the ways that repressed or hidden aspects of our past continue to return to haunt the present. And through performance, she, tell these, she tells these stories. Tonight, I've touched on only a few examples of performance across half a century, using Alicia Frankovich's work in the Anne Lander Award as a jumping off point. There's so much more to seek out and find locally, nationally, institutionally and non-institutionally in terms of performance art, as it extends from visual arts, theatre, live art and contemporary dance and the spaces between them. Performance space is, as I mentioned, turning 30 this year and our program in November will be devoted to the artists we've worked with over this time, from the members of the Sydney Front to the Young Performance Collective Brown Council. Maybe it's utterly naive of me to think this, let alone to declare it publicly, but I think there should be more artists writing manifestos and calls to action. More artists making decisions about where their work is seen and by whom, whether it's here, on the street, on the steps of parliament, or in the supermarket. I think there should be more thought about the economy and the politics of art practice, who it serves and why what kind of world we want to live in, and what kind of future we want to have. For me, performance art makes the ideas of social change, of personal sacrifice, of giving back to a culture and community somehow real and possible. And possibly naively, I think that people can be changed by what they see and experience, and that performance does have the power to transform. Thank you.